Hi everyone. Uh, so we'll start our event soon. So our event name is called FinTech The New Normal. So to start off this event, uh, we will have a pre-recorded video. Then afterwards, we will have uh, 15 minutes of Q&A by our guests on the screen here. Yeah, so feel free to ask any question after the video. Hold on, let me try. Hold on, let me try and get the audio. Welcome to this session on fintech in the new normal. I'm Dr. Lillian Ko, founder and chair of the Fintech Academy, and also chair of the Fintech Healthcare Alliance. Today, we bring you thought leaders on this crystal ball of what fintech is going to look like in the new normal. We are very pleased to bring in our professors from the Institutes of Higher Learning, as well as our practitioners who have been through the day-to-day -day grind of trying to do digital transformation and getting us to pivot and be ready, be future ready. So the future skills will see us as designers, and we have an obligation to protect health safety, welfare of the general public across all social economic classes. So basically, it is critical that the most important thing that will be the compass of our life is fintech for good. So fintech in the new normal will see us looking at creating useful things that will be very, very customer centric. That's why fintech came about, so that it's cheaper, better, faster. But at the same time, we must have our guiding principle, our primary motive and purpose in all that we do in the world of fintech and beyond. Ethics in a Sorry, everyone, we have an updated video. Hi, welcome to this session on FinTech in the new normal. I'm Dr. Lillian Ko, founder and chair of the FinTech Academy, and also chair of the FinTech Healthcare Alliance. Today, we bring you thought leaders on this crystal ball of what fintech is going to look like in the new normal. We are very pleased to bring in our professors from the Institutes of Higher Learning, as well as our practitioners who have been through 
the day-to-day -day grind of trying to do digital transformation and getting us to pivot and be ready, be future ready. So the future skills will see us as designers and we have an obligation to protect health, safety, welfare of the general public across all social economic classes. So basically, it is critical that the most important thing that will be the compass of our life is fintech for good. So fintech in the new normal will see us looking at creating useful things that will be very, very customer centric. That's why fintech came about so that it's cheaper, better, faster. But at the same time, we must have our guiding principle, our primary motive and purpose in all that we do in the world of fintech and beyond. Ethics in AI, blockchain, cloud computing, cybersecurity, everything. Everything that we use data. It is a double-edged sword, right? While we need the data and we use the data, we must realize also that it becomes a very, very powerful weapon in all that we do. So the lead designers and the planners and all the actors along this whole spectrum, from the conceptualization to the building of the algorithm to delivering all these projects, we must reflect the very same ethos throughout so that we know we are doing this to benefit the communities and to benefit the planet together with our thought leaders who have kindly contributed their time. So we are very pleased today to have Prof. Lawrence Law, an advocate of sustainability. He is going to share with us what entails being sustainable. We would like to pick your brains on what you think the future skills 2030 will be like and what do you think we can do about it to prepare for being future ready? I think it's a very, very important topic. And, and of course, if we want to talk about future skills, the more basic question is, what does the future look like? You know, inhabitants of this planet going to be light in the future. And I can upfront say that there will be no future if there's no sustainability. In other words, we, we need the existential uh, underpinning is a very, very fundamental precept uh, for us to move, uh, you know, surely and safely into the future. So sustainability is basically uh, what we want to uh, obtain. And uh, secondly, uh, if we want a sustainable world, uh, finance will be that solution. Of, of course, there are many ways to do it, but I would say that finance is one of the key uh, enabler or even builder of solutions uh, for us to transit into the sustainable world. In other words, we look at sustainable finance. And I'm sure uh, you are familiar with uh, the, the whole suite of green products from bonds to assets with ESG criteria to financing. And lately, all this converge towards uh, us achieving uh, actions uh, to mitigate uh, climate change. So if you come from a solution angle, thirdly, uh, I think uh, obviously uh, we, we need to exploit the latest technology. So this is where FinTech comes in. FinTech will provide uh, that, that big rock uh, for, for the solution to first of all, uh, achieve informational efficiency. In other words, putting all the users or the stakeholders on equal footing as far as uh, the set of knowledge uh, is concerned that there will not be any asymmetry or differences. So everybody, you know, uh, come with the eyes open and ears on the ground, everybody have the right information. And secondly, is this uh, transactional efficacy. Uh, I think uh, FinTech, uh, because of its uh, broader reach and also uh, capabilities, uh, it can get the solution uh, match, uh, getting to the right place, to the right people, the right time. So, so in other words, 
uh, it is a, a, a more superior transactional platform than traditional finance. And I think my, my last point is basically, you know, if you look at future skills, uh, fintech beyond being an uh, enabler or builder, in fact, fintech can also be an innovation in itself, uh, creating new products. Uh, it's not just to facilitate the existing product, but it can actually move uh, financial offering into a new space. So right now we are looking at, say, uh, insurance. So we have insure tech. Uh, maybe in future we have invest tech or even ESG tech. So, so I think that the, the fintech uh, really offers a vast array of uh, new opportunity for us uh, to, to innovate and uh, change uh, the entire arena of sustainable solutions through finance uh, for the future. Say this is so all-encompassing. You see, you get it everything in a nutshell. We now hear from our Professor Ho Yuki from the Singapore Institute of Technology on how the universities here are preparing our students for future skills. So, of course, uh, technical knowledge is always taken for granted, right? We are training accountants or training engineers. So the technical knowledge is always taken for granted. The only challenge is how much more do we need to pile in on top of the technical knowledge? Now, probably I would like to suggest two other areas that we need to think about. Firstly, is the soft skill. So the relational skills, you see. So we, as human beings, do not need to be afraid of uh, AI replacing us because we are uniquely human. And so this is where the students need to acquire the soft skills that brings out the very best of them as human beings. The relational skills, the negotiation skills, the communication skills, the ability to interpret uh, body language, right? the ability to take subtle cues, Right, and the ability to be able to communicate one's idea in a non-threatening manner. So this is a soft skill. The second dimension, unfortunately, we cannot run away with in today's world is that of the digital skill. Right? You need the, the IT skills to allow you to deal with the modern technology that comes with the domain expertise. I cannot, you see, in yesteryears, accountants cannot run away without knowing spreadsheet. But today, it is not enough to know spreadsheet as an accountant. You probably need to know other uh, programs. And I may even uh, consider that whether uh, accountants need to know programming skills right, in order to allow them to do their job that in the education that we have at the higher uh, Institute of Higher Learning. These are the things that we need to put into the system to augment the technical knowledge in which the people will pick up in the education at the university. Yeah, right. Uh, soft skill is very important uh, in the sense that soft skills is what makes us uniquely human. See, all right, I think uh, David Deming from Harvard University has, has done a study concerning the importance of soft skills. You may ask, what, what kind of soft skills are we talking about? Uh, we can call them the human skills, the negotiation, the communication, uh, the ability to build relationship, all right? Uh, for example, the ability to interpret nuances of human beings, right? And the uh, ability to uh, build uh, emotional banks, right? EQ. So these are soft skills that make us uniquely human. So the uniquely human skills will allow us actually in the context of a workplace to allow the best of our technical skills to surface in order to get work done, you see, right? So ultimately, if we think about, <clears throat> I go to work, uh, if I pay for a worker, what, what do I want at the end of the day? I want the work to be done effectively and efficiently. Technical skills and the technical ability to get the job done is always assumed, right? But how the individual get the work done in the most efficient and effective manner, I would like to say, to a certain extent, depends on the soft skill of the individual. Because no one person usually work alone. It requires the fellow colleagues or a team to get work done this year, right? So this is what will help us as 
human beings to be uniquely human. I would like to say that creativity uh, becomes very difficult, right? Some one school of thought says that uh, whether a person is creative is inert. Another possible school of thought is creativity actually can be uh, enhanced or can be taught to a certain extent, right? So it, at the university level, one of the major questions that we constantly ask is how can we enable our students to be creative? One possible school of thought is you put them into scenarios in which they have to think out of the box, where there are no traditional solutions or there are no so-called easy way to deal with the scenarios. But you realize that at university level, most universities are not structured that way, right? Universities are structured to teach people how to solve problems rather than to teach people how to think of solutions which is unbounded. We have an education pedagogy that is close to the industry such that we do not only teach the students the technical knowledge, but we teach them the applied skills in which they're able to solve existing problems, but we also will be teaching them the skills, the thinking, the creativity to solve new problems. Right. So uh, this particular slide actually tells, shows us some of the softwares that we are teaching our students in our undergraduate accountancy program. This is part and parcel of bringing the industry into the classroom as it is. Right. So now coming back to your bigger question concerning this uh, I 4.0, where, where, where is it leading us? I think we are very clear in our mind. The world that we live in or we are going to live in is a technological world. Right. We cannot run away from it. Is it? Automation will be there. Uh, artificial intelligence will be there. Right? Is it? There's one school of thought that basically says that oh, we human beings will become a servant to all this technology. <laughs> all right. The Terminator story will, will become the, the scene of the world as it is. I don't think so, is it? because I like to believe that human beings are much, much more versatile than that. There's some artificial intelligence, but remember, lo and behold, we design artificial intelligence, right? To a certain extent, we provide the input to it. We provide the algorithm to it as it is. But I like to believe that human beings will continue to evolve, where we will always take one step ahead in terms of, in, of technology because we are the creator of the, those technologies. How does the future world look like? The future world will be where we need to educate our students from young, the ability to handle technology, treat technology with respect, and use the technology as a tool, but not as a substitution for humanity. How would you reimagine the future of skills for us, not just in your domain as a HR professional, but what you see? the world is moving towards. Over to you, Francis. We must first reposition ourselves. Work is no longer bounded by the space you're in, the place you're in, or even time, for example. Right? So, so when you put that into the future skill set I need for this type of role in a specific location, while well, you should be thinking, oh, what are the talents that I have that would be suitable for what sort of project or task around the world, right? And that's what I would say the future of skills, right? For example, um, being Singaporean, we are, of course, bilingual. This is a very unique skill set, to be honest, right? So even you are based or live in Singapore, you could be a very important bridge for a project team in US working with another sub team in China, for example, where you can really play that bridge of not only the bridge 
in terms of language, but also in terms of culture and the way of working. I would encourage everyone to first reimagine the context of work. And right now, a lot of companies are actually realizing that we no longer need to hire a person because they are in the location we need. We need to hire a person because he or she has the skills we want. Like for myself, I want to take myself as an example. Um, I, I recently joined a new company. I've been here for about one and a half years, roughly. And the most interesting thing was the whole interview process, the whole onboarding process, yeah, until today, I have not met my boss in person. I have never even met most of my colleagues in person. And I'm already almost one and a half year in the job. Does it impact my performance? No. Does it impact my contribution? No, right? Because now I'm working in a global team. Um, I'm located in Shanghai. Yeah, uh, most of my colleagues are in Leverkusen in Germany. Some of my colleagues are in the US. Some of them are in Switzerland. So, or Belgium per se, or even France. But does it impact the way we work? No. Um, like today we are conducting this chat via Zoom and Dr. Ko, you are in Singapore while I'm in Shanghai, right? Does it impact uh, the way we interact? No. Well, we, we, will, we are human beings. We will evolve to get things done. Well, especially now with all the technology, right? Just reimagine the future of skills is enough. First, you must first reimagine the future of work. And then you say, okay, um, what sort of talents and skill I have currently? What sort of interests I have? And perhaps that's an area I could develop. Mm. And then how I offer such skills and talent refreshing perspective that I've heard so far. This talent pavilion, we actually are hoping that this will rub off our audience who are listening in now. So later, Dennis is going to show you how designing it right is a key lever to achieve the target that fintechs need in order to be cost effective so that you can be targeting segments that may seem marginally profitable or even unprofitable, but there's a lot of opportunities. So these design considerations involve implementing methodologies, focusing on company-wide and functional design considerations that will ensure smooth operations later. So new ways of working must be taught and inculcated in the fintech world. The three essential key methodologies are design thinking, lean and agile. So with these three methodologies put together, it's really, really forming the basic building blocks for a software factory. The design set up and smooth running of a concept to code software factory is critical to the success of your fintech. So let's spend some time to understand these new ways of working as that will save you a lot of time later. So start right, not as an afterthought. So over to you, Dennis. Look at the fintech fundamentally. Fintechs are really about taking the design considerations, right? And these design considerations come from understanding the customer very well, and therefore uh, uh, designing 
products and services that the customer really wants. And of course, over and above that, it's also looking at how uh, the entire business model is designed for efficiency. Design thinking, Lean Six Sigma, and Agile. Let me go through each of these modules in a bit more detail to explain to the audience what it's all about. The first piece, uh, solution comes first. Often it's not clear what the problem is and companies are trying to find that killer app. So this is uh, dangerous because I think it's always better to understand what is the question rather than know the answer is really about getting this right and creating an organization that is extremely efficient and effective. And I think the agile method, uh, different agile methods, uh, whether you are using Scrum or some other method, are fairly well defined today. The major issue that fintechs need to get right is how you combine the front in the design and the back in the agile through a very strong understanding of process. Because customers are often very interested in how they can de design and develop new products using design thinking. And uh, the technology department or vendors are reasonably adept today at you know, writing code using a combination of uh, waterfall and agile. But what is missing is really the understanding of the business process. First, uh, understanding the segment. And that's important because different segments have different needs. Once you can identify certain segments of interest, and I recommend that it should be at least two or three so that you have choice. And not just starting with one, which means that you know, you're already uh, uh, kind of uh, made the decision to identify this segment. So having two or three gives you choice. And the next step is really understanding the gaps. What are the expectations? What are the habits? What are the unmet needs uh, and that these uh, segments have? And from here, very importantly, is then the understanding of the insight. And design thinking is really a process whereby uh, using human-centered design, you can really understand how customers behave. Uh, and insight is really all about why customers behave this way. So uh, to give you an example, it's really through understanding navigation very well. And one of the insights we uh, found in understanding how to design uh, tomorrow is very simple was that really menus are the designer's way of forcing you to navigate an app or a web version the way he intended you to, right? So in that sense, it restricts you to the method of navigation that he has created. And once we realized that one of the things that became apparent to us was if we reduced menus, then navigation would be a lot simpler. And so this is exactly uh, what, how we went about uh, creating the experience using this insight. We began to strip out a lot of the first level menus and replace them actually with graphical iconic representation. And once you start doing that, you end up with uh, a menu system that's extremely easy to navigate and use. And uh, today what you see in the tomorrow uh, interface is exactly that. And you can see therefore that understanding this insight was very powerful because without this insight, if we had just briefed the teams to build a simple app, they wouldn't have come out with the same thing as the mantra to eliminate as many first level menus as possible. So insight is critical in this stage. And the, the role of design thinking is really to allow you to be close to customers so that you understand the way customers think, the way they go about doing their jobs, right? The whole process of empathizing, uh, ideating, testing, and making sure that you have something that can really be used uh, to design the experience. And in this case, this example that I'm uh, citing is really eliminating the first level menus. The role of design thinking is really to allow you to be Hi, uh, Dr. Go, go ahead. 
Okay, so I think uh, it's frozen, right? Yep, I paused it. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay, so what has happened is that Dennis has been explaining to us, all right, how this design thinking is going to roll out. He's going to continue later. We'll send you the clip so you can continue later. So now we have got uh, Dennis to continue and uh, we've got David, Dr. David Ng, can you wave? <laughs> all right, and uh, Dr. Dennis Koo. Right, so we have them here to explain to you um, those questions that some of you have brought up. Uh, David has immediately jumped on that question that Cynthia has asked. So maybe David, you want to elaborate before uh, I carry on? Yeah, thanks for the question, Cynthia. Please keep them coming. So uh, Dennis, Cynthia was asking about really looking at you know the, 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 the ongoing trend and how the trend in really fintech and innovation may impact the older generation. Uh, that has, you know, limited capabilities and how can they cope with this new norm? Uh, well, I, unfortunately, I think uh, the older folks uh, who can't, uh, you know, navigate it, I guess one of the ways is to really make it easier for them so they don't get so confused. Uh, but I think it's really down to the individual because, you know, my dad uh, at, uh, I think, 80 taught himself how to use uh, Facebook uh, and mm -hmm. other applications. So it's down to interest as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that helps significantly to make the uh, person more comfortable. But for the rest of the people who are not so comfortable using technology, then the design element is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's especially important in basic necessities, right? Like for example, when banking becomes purely online, in fact, uh, you know, there are some states in the US that pass laws to uh, not allow digital-only payment because they figure that you know, the old people, they, they might not be comfortable using digital-only payment. So it's really about making the experience easy. And, and that, I think, helps uh, significantly to uh, reduce the friction uh, uh, that they have to overcome in order to use it. So definitely design thinking is one of the ways that can help together understanding the process and making the process very simple. So all these things together make a brilliant experience. And with a brilliant experience, it does bring the barrier uh, to usage down. Great. And I think uh, for maybe some of the listeners out there, uh, Dr. Dennis's background uh, has, has included an illustrious sort of six or seven years at uh, Tomorrow at UOB, where he's pioneered uh, you know, a very user-centric app. Um, and just with that experience and what you've heard from the prior speakers, uh, Dennis, uh, I think also riffing off Cynthia's question, turn it around, not from a user point of view, but from maybe your dev team uh, and, and you know, across the design thinking lean and agile. T can you comment about you know, those on the wrong side of 40 or 45, take your age, uh, how do they pivot? How do they get the skills to, to ride this new trend? Uh, well, I, I think there are many areas right, you, can, you can get into. Uh, if the area could be in uh, software development, so you have to pick up uh, coding, uh, and that could be one of the entry points. The other is uh, if you're not so uh, you know, a, a, a tuned or uh, uh, interested in software development, then there's a lot of project management uh, work that uh, required to pull the entire uh, program together mm. because there are many, many streams Important. operating mm. uh, at the same time. Mm. Uh, there's research mm. uh, because there's a need to get close to the customer, understand what the customer is doing. Mm. Uh, so there are these uh, facets because in reality, I would say that um, the technology piece is one aspect, you know, one very important aspect. And in the rest of the video, uh, I, I, I further uh, describe how design and process are very important uh, because if you get the design and the process right, then designing the user interface should be quite straightforward. And um, most of the complexity in difficult uh, to do uh, transformations are not necessary in the front technology, really in the back technology because the back end systems are hard to uh, add on to, hard to modify, uh, they may be monolithic in nature. 
So in fact, it's not just uh, you know, in the technology area that uh, someone could be able to contribute uh, if they switch over in the mid 40s. They're thinking through the entire gambit. Uh, there's a lot of change management involved. And therefore, there's a lot of opportunity to assist uh, in the non-tech areas. Yeah, I noticed uh, uh, Professor Ho from Singapore uh, Institute of Technology, he talked about the importance of communication skills as a part of future skills. And you know, my, my kind of take on that is, is the older you are, the wiser you are in terms of communication skills. And so I'd be interested in your comments and your frontline experience about recruiting you know, uh, is it biased towards younger sort of 20 something year old programmers? Uh, you know, what is the role of a 40 or 50 something year old, you know, maybe in that wider value chain that, that you, you went through? Um, first, I mean, we, we look at certain attributes that are important, right? So uh, there was a list of attributes we created. Uh, they revolve around things like, uh, you know, being able to communicate succinctly so as you, meant, as you mentioned, communication is important uh, and uh, being able to tell something uh, that is complicated in a simple way, in a succinct way is quite important because otherwise the meeting drags on forever. Yes. Right? So that's one important attribute. We look at people who uh, are brave. They're able to speak up and speak their mind and of course logically defend their position. Uh, we look at uh, people who have systems thinking uh, because the programs tend to be very complicated and you need to take a look at the whole thing in totality because often if you just look at one thing right and fix that one thing you don't realize that it, it has reverberating effects on everything else so uh, that's an important uh, you know attribute uh, someone who is uh, basically responsible and accountable uh, uh, for the results uh, that's uh, important. So there's a whole a list of attributes, uh, you know, we look for. And I think uh, today, because the, um, this area is so short, uh, I think there's almost no choice but to hire based on the attitude and attributes. And then uh, if the person's attitude and attribute is good, then you've got to allow the person to read up and uh, learn about it. So that's how, you know, I would go about um, trying to overcome uh, the shortage. Right. And I'm guessing at UOB or maybe other places that you've seen digital transformation, uh, you've had to repurpose some mid-career people. So at UOB, if you go back, whether it's five or 10 years, people, you know, there were no jobs in digital or there were no sort of apps as we see tomorrow and, and similar. So can you talk about kind of issues around repurposing or identifying people to switch within uh, you know, a UOB or other corporations? And you know, where, did, where did they learn that kind of stuff? Is so, it themselves I, or I, offline? Yeah, I won't uh, speak for UOB, but in general, right, you can see that uh, just even in Singapore, the number of branches are coming down, yeah. right, which means the uh, tellers, the uh, person in the branch, you've got to um, retool them. And actually, I think uh, the um, MAS has done a good job kind of a curriculum uh, where you can learn the basics uh, you know, of, uh, for example, design thinking uh, and other disciplines like that that they need to understand to switch over. So I think a lot of it, uh, to be honest, is more in the operations in the branch where things are being automated, right? So for example, if you have a robotics process automation, you may uh, eliminate the need for someone who's cutting and pasting information from different places. Uh, and those people will need to be redeployed. I think the best way uh, for individuals also to have a growth mindset and to be curious about you know, what's going on because if you have not uh, done anything except uh, very, step-by-step -step, uh, task, you know, for 20 years, it will be a very big shock for you to suddenly, you know, be able, uh, have, have to require yourself to, uh, you know, really transform your skills. A better way is really uh, to understand and pay attention to what's happening and to pick up uh, some of the basic skills on an ongoing basis. 
And I think Singapore is unique from the standpoint that uh, there is a skills future fund, right? So you can actually use a skills future fund to update yourself on a regular basis, even if it's something not directly related to your job right now, rather than to uh, uh, you know, wait and then one day when the job is no longer viable because of all the uh, you know, advancements mm. in uh, machines, algorithms replacing humans, mm. I think that when a day comes, it, it can be sometimes too late. Yeah. Very yeah. right. I think uh, we, we had that book that says, Who Moved My Cheese? Remember that book? Yeah. Yes. This is exactly what's happening. So you're right, Dennis, that the growth mindset is super important. But what's even more important is, I want to tell you the story. In 2015, when we heard about, whoa, this, there's a rise of fintech, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I actually went to the counter, one bank counter, and I was trying to fill in a TT form to send money. And I told that girl there that, sadly, this is no longer going to work because we don't want to fill in a hard copy TT form. And then we have to wait three days, five days for the corresponding banks to react. And then by the time the money gets there, there are so, um, so much changes because Forex rates and uh, corresponding bank charges, etc. And guess what? I told her this job is going to be gone. True enough, the next year, TransferWise came, or rather it's called Wise now. And we all do our remittances through the phone, almost real time. So, so gone are the days when the old ways of banking is going to work because our expectations have been raised due to the disruptions by fintech. So such disruption is now called transformation. So what happens to our people who are unemployed or have to be deployed? So you, again, gave a very good example of RPA. The robotic process automation does come in in quite a big wave. And we saw one group actually getting training within two weeks time, everybody get on board, use the new toy. It works. Yeah. And in FinTech Academy, we were mounting a course. It was a 60 hour course, I'm sorry, 80 hour course on what is FinTech. And in 2017, 2018, we were mounting that course for people who are 40 and above. And guess what? We were pleasantly surprised that some of our people in our group went on to do their masters. Excellent. Excellent. In different universities, yeah. in SUTD, in NTU, in NUS. So there is always this growth mindset yes. in our people. So it, it is not the age, it's the mindset. Exactly. So age is just one number. Whether you are 18 or 19 or whether you are 70 or 50, it doesn't matter. What matters is you must always be curious and you must always want to stay relevant. And that wins it all, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and I think one, one more thing to add uh, to the comments Lydia made, right, David, is I think this whole area of process, right? Understanding uh, lean techniques, understanding how a Six Sigma, th there's a big gap in the market because mm -hmm. there's a lot of attention on the front, right? In designing products, services, the business model and, and design thinking. And a lot of people offering design thinking. Uh, then uh, Agile, I think all the Agile methods are fairly well known today. And I mean, if you're not, haven't coded before and you want to learn coding at 50, I think it was quite difficult. But process, right? I think a lot of our 40s, 50 mm. uh, workforce, right? They understand mm. process. Mm. And process is a big gap because uh, often you end up with uh, one line user stories. Mm. You know, the uh, uh, software team doesn't know what you want. Mm. And process actually is very, very key. So I predict that uh, because, you know, so many transformations don't work out, right? And one of the key reasons they don't work out is because the process is missing. And I think there's going to be a big uh, a demand for people that can map out the process, simplify the process, use the lean techniques. And I think this is a very suitable entry point for a lot of mid-career uh, people out there. Yeah, I like that because I think for, for, for me, process uh, is, is the corollary of digitization. Yes, exactly. I guess I want to sort of like get both of you because we've both got the 
pleasure of two doctors in the room here, uh, to kind of talk about maybe a roadmap. Uh, so what I hear, and let's take one end of the roadmap, maybe mm -hmm. many of those 40 odd people in this call now uh, uh, are sitting through this, you know, aside from being entertained by Dr. Dennis and Dr. Lillian, it's also about getting the certificate. So as you may or may not know, you can get up to three certificates from, uh, and then doing the multiple choice. So that's kind of, you know, I'd put it sort of down here in terms of certification, right? Uh, and then up here, you know, Lillian talked about some of her, her sort of graduates, FTA, getting a master's degree. Mm. Now that's a, that's a big spectrum, you know, certificate from today uh, or these three days, a master's. And so then I kind of think about also complexity of that, that, that really that journey, you know, the customer journey of someone that wants to be in the, in, in the, in the uh, digital game. Uh, you know, how to plan that. You talked about skills, future, MAS have a lot of education options. There's traditional education out there, you know, NUS, whatever, SIT. Uh, then you've got sort of private academies. So I'd be interested in how you can help maybe some of those in this call to navigate, you know, how to get the best return. Um, uh, one of the things you, you, one of the facets you mentioned was around, more around customers, right? Uh, um, and, and I think that part is uh, quite challenging because even if you go through all the certification, even if you do have a postgraduate degree, uh, you cannot uh, remove or replace the need to have done it before. So that's the difficult part, right? Because uh, the customer piece is fundamentally uh, not a science, it's an art, right? So in what I do uh, in the methodology that I've created, uh, there is a a part of that method where you go from segments to gaps to insights to experience and to business process, right? It is the insight piece that really needs uh, uh, practice because uh, there's almost no way to drive it from a formula perspective. So in that sense, uh, even if you have, you're armed with a lot of certificates and degrees, right? Uh, you're going to have to figure out how to do it, how to answer the fundamental question, why does the customer behave this way? Right. So, so I think uh, there's also need to be the willingness to take on the not so uh, glamorous roles in, in, in the beginning to learn the ropes, to understand mm -hmm. that. But I think that's, that's pretty valuable mm -hmm. uh, because fundamentally it's not a science, right? You, 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 you can be armed with all the necessary qualifications, but uh, we haven't progressed it to the stage where you can really uh, do it mathematically. So you actually got to go down, you got to understand, you got to ask the right questions. So this needs someone uh, to really understudy and have the right practice. Great. Okay. So, so you're talking and I guess I'm going back to Cynthia's question about kind of roadmap and, you know, how, you know, maybe mid-career people sort of make sense of this. And you talked about experience and, you know, really that is key. So I like that. Yeah. So maybe Lillian can talk because Lillian has got a great sort of view of formal education and then sort of private education. And, you know, you have a lot of clientele and I'm just guessing that a lot of people online are kind of thinking, oh, wow. You know, you know I'm sure a lot of people heard, you know, the minister this morning and, and Balaji and other luminaries, you know, but how do I sift through all this? Yeah. What does it mean for me? How do I personalize these three days or this week? For, for, for me and, you know, to bring in, you know, Professor Lawrence, you know, he talked about, Lawrence Lowe, he talked about sustainability at the beginning, kind of, you know, it's not random, it's topical for sure, uh, but it all kind of dovetails in, but, you know, Lillian, maybe you can initially talk about how the heck does someone make a roadmap out of this or that means something for someone from a personal point of view so that they future-proof. Okay, let's do the mainstream, all right? I have been teaching in NTU for 17 years. So through that 17 years, I've seen people go through bachelor's degree, master's degree, and even doctorate, because I sit on a lot of thesis committees to, uh, to, do, uh, to guide uh, PhD students. But one thing is very important. You realize that whatever we learn, we must apply. So you see nowadays, all the undergrads would have internship program that is built into the main bachelor degree program. That is very important. During my time, when I was at NUS uh, Business School 
a student. I never had internship, but I took the initiative of knocking on the doors of Richard Yu, the group CEO of uh, Yu Yan San. So I go knock, knock, and I say, hi, may I be attached to you as an intern for my summer holidays? And he goes like, sure, why not? And, and there, I was already working with him right through my three years of bachelor degree. In my honest year, I took on a job with US Embassy. Straight away, I suddenly learned so much more new things. Of course, I did learn when I was with uh, Richard Yu. But when I went to uh, my BBA honors year, I had to do market research. And the US Embassy is the most fertile ground for me to put into practice what I learned from Professor James McCullough. I go in, do my work, and I get paid. So it's a win-win situation. So now our university students are so blessed because the university you know, goes carrying around looking for matching internship for them and even going abroad you know, for exchange programs. These are wonderful rich opportunities which you must leverage on. So that is necessary. And I am very proud to say that our Singapore education system, it's really progressive. So that opens up a lot of opportunities. Back to post-university, or even those who don't get to the university, post-poly, post-ITE, it doesn't matter because what's important is you must always stay curious. You must always ask questions because if you don't ask, nobody knows what is it that you don't know, right? And when you make an effort to ask, even if it is an old man, 55, 60, retiring, he has been there, done there. So, so listen to the war stories, learn from it. I don't know whether you have watched that movie, The Intern. It shows that senior intern, he's retired. He went back to the old building, more for reminiscing, going down memory lane. And then he suddenly found this, uh, in, in Singapore, we call it Chili Padi, right? This young CEO, very vibrant, very IT savvy. And yet, she needed mentoring, which she didn't realize until she had this intern. So the intern was there like, a, you know, um, as and when you need to run an errand, you know, the uncle is there for you. But in the end, she has learned a lot about life from this senior intern. So the beauty of it is, it is all about lifelong learning. And the fact that you are here, the fact that we have this Singapore FinTech Festival, is a wonderful platform. And if you and it's an opportunity cause you go like, no, 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 no. I have enough, I'm Zoom fatigue, I'm going off. You're missing out on a lot of what you could have picked up. In this one hour session, you may have picked up a few pointers, maybe not immediately useful, but that seed that is planted in you may go like, oh yeah. Suddenly, you know, you are able to have that insight to make meaning out of what you just heard say from Dennis or from David. So learning is never wasted. And, and, and yes, congratulations, you are here with us today. We will provide um, the, the recording of uh, Dr. Dennis Ku and all the rest of the speakers you heard just now for you, all right? So if you stay tuned to our WhatsApp group, we will send you the links. We will even send you the uh, PowerPoint slides if you want. All right. It's a great example of, of, of mindset, right? Yes. Uh, 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 growth mindset and yes. uh, curiosity in uh, Lillian. Yes. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. So, so, yes, do join us in the WhatsApp group and uh, make your request. All right. We are very happy to share. I'll just add one more quick thing, David, that I think uh, for most uh, people in mid-career, I would say the process entry point is easier because the coding entry point and the designing entry point, you know, I think uh, you need to have some practice. But the process entry point, uh, as a 40, 50 year old, you, you'll be exposed to process, right? Doing process mapping, doing process improvement, right? And you're, you're merely taking the lean to maybe get the certification. So it's the other way around. You already have the experience. 
you're just getting the certification to kind of get the stamp of uh, the methodology. And so I think that, you know, in many cases, that might be an easy entry point and competing with all the youngsters who are already doing design thinking, all the other youngsters that are doing programming. And most youngsters are not in the, the, the middle part, which is very important, the process. Fantastic to hear. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, the whole growth mindset, you know, that's a favorite topic of mine. So uh, I, I refer those online to uh, Meg J. So there's a terrific TED talk on that. And, and she basically is refreshing uh, uh, Carol Dweck's uh, work on this. So uh, we'll send that through on the, the uh, group chat. Um, so maybe if you could just have a couple of quick, you know, closing comments from both Dennis and, and Lillian, uh, you know, just given the scope of, of, of today and, you know, just, you know, listening to uh, Sweet King this morning, uh, you know, great ecosystem, foresight in Singapore and then, you know, Balaji and just, you know, the scope and impact of potentially uh, blockchain and beyond. Uh, so I think, you know, how that scope can sort of, you know, if you can summarize in a minute or so, you know, what people can online take from this week uh, and, and, and look at, you know, how that impacts their talent journey. So Maybe Dennis, go first. Yeah. Always be curious, always learning. All right, these are my two takeaway messages for you. And uh, we hope to see you on Thursday and Friday. I think for me, uh, the fundamental building block, right, of any uh, digital company uh, as, and uh, fintech basically fits that mode uh, precisely well, right? Uh, is really an understanding of the front, which is the customer, the service, the product, and their design is king. You need to understand the design because if you design it wrongly, right? Like in building a building, if you want to change the toilets after you build it, it's very difficult. And then, uh, uh, so the design is really like the architect. And then you have process, right? It's like the civil engineer. Uh, and you, you really need to get the process right. So if you have a building uh, designed by a great architect, you have a great uh, civil engineer, make sure that you know it can stand on its uh, foundations, then the builder has a much easier job. And the builder is really the person who's doing all the coding, right? So these three are indispensable. And, and even the, at the CEO level, the CEO needs to be very familiar with it. Because if you don't, it's not possible to great, uh, provide great experience at very low cost. Great. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dennis and uh, Lillian. Uh, so thank you for joining us uh, for this hour. Um, I think in the uh, chat function, there are a couple of links there. And I think uh, as Lillian intimated, I think Thursday and Friday, there are a couple of other sessions with uh, FTA. Okay. So keep in touch, okay. stay safe. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, don't we want a group photo? Shall we have a group photo? Sure. Yeah, turn yeah. on your videos. Make it a memorable one that you have joined the Singapore FinTech Festival. There you go. Suwe is here. Marcus, thanks for your support. Don't be shy. Yes, Cynthia. <laughs> ah, Ichu. All right. Yes, Kavya. Come on, come on, everyone. Turn on your photo and we can have a group picture. It's going to go a long way. All right, give us the cue when you are ready right. to snap. Yes. Okay, uh, five, four, three, two. A thumbs up? Yeah, thumbs up everyone. Three, two, one. Okay, got it. Thank you, thank you everyone. Have a good evening. We'll see you again at the more exciting sessions to come. See you. Keep in touch. Bye. Bye.